Colonel is a stowaway on an airship, and she's been discovered by the less than friendly zealots on board. Left with no recourse, she prepares for the fight of her life, only to have everything rudely interrupted by a nasty storm. A bolt of lightning splits the ship asunder, sending our spunky heroine crashing into the game's tutorial area below. Marooned on a floating island, Vernal decides there's only one means of escape, by commandeering another airship, because a girl with daddy issues can't be stopped, only slowed down. Vernal Edge is a darn good metroidvania that just barely misses greatness. I played it on Nintendo Switch and suffered some pretty heinous technical issues, but I'll discuss that later. Right now, I want to talk about Vernal Edge's merits and shortcomings as a metroidvania. To do that, let's get right into the meat and potatoes of Vernal Edge. It's combat. Okay, I'm about to say some things about the combat that I feel needs to be said, but please know that I actually enjoyed the combat a lot. I'm going to give it to you straight. Combat in Vernal Edge is fun until it isn't. People liken its combat to Devil May Cry, but I wouldn't give the game such praise. You have only one weapon, one combo on the ground and one in the air, one hit charged attacks, pulse attacks, which I'll get into later, and four slots for equipable spells. Ideally, you'll be dispatching your enemies by using all these tools to juggle them, knocking them into the air and keeping them up there for as long as possible while you wail on them. Juggling is great at first, but it gets old when it's the only real option to do significant damage. And in order to get juggling to work, the devs made every enemy super tanky, so fights always seem to last longer than they should. Occasionally, enemies have little blue spheres above their heads to indicate they have poise, which translates to super armor, which translates to your attacks not making them flinch. The only way to break poise is to hit enemies with the last hit of your combo, or hit them with a charged attack, or a spell strong enough to break poise. Remove all their spheres and boom, they get stunned. Knock them into the air and juggle until their poise reappears. Rinse and repeat until they die. Then, do it to every enemy on the screen. There were times I entered a flow state during combat and was having a blast, but that was only in a few areas, one of which was the battle tower, an area dedicated to fighting. But when I was out exploring, combat could get pretty tedious when all I really wanted to do was run around and find things. But the game likes to bring everything to a screeching halt by locking you into battle arenas a la Guacamelee. This wouldn't have been so bad except the game's enemy variety is so sparse. This is just a guess, but I bet there are only like 10 enemy types in the entire game. Once you get their patterns down, you're pretty set pretty early. Now, I don't want you to think I didn't like the combat, I just think it got old against the same tanky enemies. And there's this weird mechanic where you have to press the jump button to get up after you get hit. That honestly got really annoying. But, putting all my gripes aside, the boss battles were in a league of their own. Before elaborating on boss battles, there are two other facets to combat you need to familiarize yourself with. Parries and pulse attacks. Initially, I tried playing the game without using the parry because I hate parries, but you absolutely have to use them on the end game bosses. They're relentless and leave no openings to punish them after they attack, so you have to parry and make your own openings. Once I wrapped my head around this, I found the later boss fights to be incredibly challenging yet fair and super satisfying. But I'll warn you, the difficulty spike for these bosses is drastic. They're so hard, it's like you're playing an entirely different game. Anyway, pulse attacks are something you also need to figure out if you're going to beat these bosses. Not only are they attacks that hit multiple times, a must for juggling, but they also heal you. It took me a minute to understand how to use pulse attacks because I'm dumb or something, but here's how you do it. You press the pulse attack button to throw your sword at the enemy. Upon hitting them, a sword icon will appear above their head. This doesn't mean you can't use your sword. It means they're locked on for the attack. While an enemy is locked on, you can still use your regular attacks. I don't know why that took me so long to figure out. Anyway, while locked on, you can press the pulse attack button at any time to do a pulse attack, damaging the enemy and healing yourself in the process. Combining pulse attacks, spells, and your regular and charged attacks helps keep the combat fresh and fast. I just wish the enemies went down fast too, I guess. Another thing you'll need to pay attention to during combat are all the meters in the top left corner. The red meter is your health, blue is mana for spells, the circle is pulse attacks, and a smaller meter will get unlocked that controls your bloom. More on that in a sec. Meter management is integral to combat, but each meter fills up differently. Pulse is easy. Wax stuff with your sword and it goes up. Same with bloom. But mana is kinda dumb. 
Mana doesn't replenish until you completely deplete it. Then it takes a minute to fully recharge. It took me forever to realize this. Again, because I'm stupid, I guess. So many times I screwed myself because I wanted to hold on to my mana just in case I needed it, when actually it was better just to use it so you could get a brand new charge. It was obnoxious at first, but not so bad after you figured it out. Finally, there's Bloom. It has a meter that takes a while to charge, but when it's full, it allows Vernal to do a screen clearing special attack. It's great in a pinch and changes Vernal's hair color like she's a Super Saiyan or something, so you know it's cool. Let's talk about Vernal's abilities, the keys to unlocking the map. First off, the only way I can think of describing Vernal's movements in general is snappy. She's so fast and nimble, it made exploration so fun. I can't think of a Metroidvania protagonist as fast as her. Maybe Ori, but I think Vernal has him beat. Very early in the game, Vernal gets an air dash that doubles as an evasive maneuver. She also gets wall kicks, wall runs, a pound move to break floors, step jumps off of lanterns and stuff, this weird jump she unleashes after her air dash, freaking flying, and probably the most important ability ever, the ability to read. Seriously, Vernal doesn't know how to read at the beginning of the game. Anyway, with the exception of reading, all of these abilities make traversing Vernal Edge an absolute blast. I think that's why combat felt so grating to me at times, because I wanted to use these abilities to run all over the place. It really is a lot of fun, especially because exploration is so rewarding. Most of the time you'll find a chest with money in it, but there are so many other things to find along the way. HP and MP increases, hidden spells, mini games with prizes, side quests, secret areas, and memories and memory points, which I'll delve into soon. Needless to say, I loved exploring Vernal Edge's map. Or, should I say, maps. One of the finer aspects of Vernal Edge is its openness. Of course, there are certain paths you must take in order to progress, but progression is never fed to you. You're dropped into this world and given the opportunity to go where the winds may take you. Vernal Edge's world takes place on a series of floating islands you sail to via your stolen airship, given there isn't an unreality storm obscuring the island you want to visit. More on those storms later. To guide players, each island is given a threat level to indicate its difficulty, i.e. telling the player in which order you should explore the islands. It's ham-fisted and cheap, but it works. My biggest problem was the map system. Each island is its own self-contained level and requires you to find its map. I hate when Metroidvanias don't just give you a map. Regardless, the map is super useful and creates icons automatically to help you remember where you need to use certain abilities. Now, I love when Metroidvanias do that. Overall, I loved sailing to the different islands to explore them. It added greatly to the game's verisimilitude, and each island was so different. Some you needed to explore to progress with the game, and some only held side quests or mini games or puzzles or platforming challenges. And let me tell you, some of the platforming in this game is challenging, but it's all fun as heck because Vernal moves so quickly. I think my favorite island was the one with all the fungus. There's a really interesting gimmick here that I won't spoil, but anyone in the know will understand when I say it took me way longer than I'd like to admit to figure out what the spores from the big mushrooms did. I guess what I'm saying is that there's a lot to do and explore in Vernal Edge. Vernal Edge's atmosphere is kind of a mixed bag. I'm lukewarm on its art direction. Cutscenes look painted and smeared, and the overall color palette is muted. I loved the NPCs and the towns and a lot of the environments, but the music was pretty hit or miss, and the enemy design was atrocious. What even are those things? They look like nothing else in the game, and they're never explained. Granted, I didn't read all of the secret books, so maybe they expound on what these things are? I have my guesses, but I don't want to potentially spoil too much as this is still a relatively new game. Plus, there's no true ending, so I figured the books would only add to the world building. That finally brings us to the story. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't dive too deeply into specifics. All you really need to know to understand Vernal's motivation is that she wants to kill her father. That being said, I really enjoyed Vernal Edge's story, even if it did leave a few major loose ends dangling after the credits. It also starts out pretty slow. Initially, Vernal's running around aimlessly to find information on her father. It lacks direction and any real stakes, and the payoff is pretty weak. She ends up finding random stuff that just conveniently can be put together to create something useful. The game then turns into a MacGuffin fetch quest, which worked well enough. At least the player is given a more tangible goal. 
When it comes to the game's narrative, its lead characters and world building are its strongest suits. Vernal and her robot companion Chervil are likable and play off each other well, with Vernal being a stubborn hothead and Chernal being more analytical and realistic. Watching them develop as individuals and as a pair was a treat. The world of Vernal Edge is interesting and presents itself to players in a way that rewards you for paying attention to the environments and character dialogue. World building elements are delivered in such a way that exposition doesn't bore you to death. Instead, Vernal Edge lets players marinate in the intrigue by introducing things without explaining them, allowing players to experience and figure things out before the game answers anything. For most of the game, players will be batting questions around in their heads like, why does Vernal want to kill her father? Why are these islands floating? What happened 20 years ago? What's so special about Vernal's sword? What is unreality? This is the kind of storytelling I adore in Metroidvanias. Vernal Edge constantly drops breadcrumbs to keep you guessing, making it hard to put it down. But intrigue isn't the only thing the story has going for it. It knows when to get emotional too. There's this really touching moment when Vernal finally learns how to read. Throughout the game, Vernal carries within her inventory an unopened letter from her mother. It isn't until later that you discover it's unopened because Vernal doesn't know how to read. In this world, skills can be taught to people via memory discs. Think how Neo learned Kung Fu instantly in The Matrix. This is such a unique way to introduce spells and abilities in this world, searching for discs and chips to upgrade yourself. Now, Vernal isn't a machine, though I have a hunch that she's something special that the game, to my knowledge, doesn't elaborate on. Nevertheless, this technology works on regular humans. Technology plays a big role within Vernal Edge, so it's interesting to see how religion is portrayed throughout. The final interesting point I want to touch is reality versus unreality and the storms it causes. Again, I'm not here to spoil, but I liked this concept and enjoyed exploring it, both literally and figuratively. I just wish Vernal Edge went deeper with these concepts and used them to create an alternate path and true ending. It's a shame they didn't because the story certainly lends itself to going off the rails and offering Vernal an alternative to revenge. If anything, with so much left on the table and unfulfilled, I bet there's some DLC down the line. There's just got to be more to this story and it's a testament to the game that it left me wanting more. Before I end this, I want to talk about the technical issues I experienced while playing on the Nintendo Switch. In the last couple of hours of the game, it started stuttering pretty badly. It wasn't terrible like a frame rate dip, but every 5 seconds or so, the game would pause for a second and then pick back up. This got incredibly frustrating during boss fights and demanding platforming sections because the little hiccups would negate my commands, leading to a bunch of botched parries and mistimed jumps. Thankfully and strangely, this only happened in dock mode. Once I went into handheld, everything played normally. I don't know what to make of it. I played this game a few weeks ago, so there's a good chance it's been patched by now. Just take caution and do some research before you purchase the Switch version. In the end, would I recommend Vernal Edge to Metroidvania fans? Absolutely. Though combat has the potential to become tedious to some players, like me, it's still fun and fast. The story and world keeps you engaged and exploration feels rewarding and has a real sense of discovery. But be warned, there are a lot of reviewers out there who criticize the game for being too open in the beginning, leading to confusion and getting lost. I never had that issue, but I am the Metroidvania guru, so I'm just built different. Definitely pick Vernal Edge up. It's a great time from beginning to end.